kinds? I mean, this is a perfect segue to our next medicine because uh, we do have frontline Folfox plus minus EGFR um, uh, in the prime study. Yes. And so, um, and uh, this study continues to mature. We have PAN-RAS uh, testing now there. Maybe give us a quick overview with panitubumab um, and, and its incorporation into frontline. Remembering that in the U.S. we right now only have official indication uh, in last line. Guidelines give us freedom to pretty much do what we want. Um, What's at you, the EU has embraced this. Tell us about the study and what we know. So I think we, ha we have to give the developers of panetumab a lot of credit. The reason we have KVAS was the single agent panetumab study. And of course, there is a lot of motivation behind it to develop a drug, but you know the clinical outcome were just borderline. With the molecular testing, it became big. Yeah. So with the conduct of Folfox um, in combination with panetumab versus Folfox, as well as Folfox in combination with panetumab versus the bevazuzumab Folfox combination were perfect designed clinical trials to show the benefit of panetumab versus chemo alone or the bevazuzumab combination. And both showed promising results but not reaching in all clinical outcome uh, parameters the clinical significance. So it was more than logical to see, can we select patients who benefit, benefit more, looking just going down the pathway, expanding the vast mutational testing. And what they showed in both studies, that the clinical outcome data improved, if this was response or PFS or overall survival. Now, sometimes the number limited to reach the clinical significant p-value of 0.05, but all the data moved in the right directions, making or justifying that this expanded fast testing will increase the potential benefit. But these studies were very critical because they showed when patients were treated with panitumumab in combination with Folfox, there was potential harm. These data led to an accelerated approval with EMA to make sure we do the VAS testing when we use this drug in Europe. And was a platform for the testing in FIRE 3 and will be now used in all the EGF receptor containing clinical trials. We will see at this meeting the Opus data using very increased sensitivity. We will see the crystal expanded VAS data at ASCO and I don't think this will be a surprise. It will go all in the same directions. So I think we have learned a lot with this particular panetumab trials, forcing us and pushing molecular diagnostic in our clinical practice to make better treatment decisions. I had a moment, Marwan, in my thinking that EGFRs were better with arenatecan than ox. And then this data from Prime sort of changes my mind about that. Um, and so I'm softening that stance, if you will. But we also do have Fulfiri plus minus panitumumab in the 181 study. Um, so kind of working the other way from first line down to last line. Second line study, give us a little background on that trial and what sure, Prime so, has so, done for us. I so, mean, what 181 has done for right, us. Right, so, so what 181 did is, is look at the uh, effectiveness of adding anti-HFR therapy with Fulfiri backbone in patients who failed 5-FU uh, or a fluoropyrimidine plus oxaliplatin with metastatic colorectal cancer. And uh, what this study had shown is that if you select patients who have KRAS wild-type tumors, that you will actually improve the progression-free survival of those patients by two months. Also, it has shown a very important endpoint is that you've also improved their response rate. Now, whether that improves the cure with the resectability or not, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a question that has not been answered, but I think it's an important endpoint because the data is also mixed about anti-HFR therapy for the purpose of making a borderline resectable or unresectable resectable. What we know from EPOC is that these are resectable patients who could be potentially harmed, but you want to get patients resectable. So I think two things we've learned is in the second line setting, you get favorable response rates when you add penitumumab or an anti-HFR agent in addition to chemotherapy in KRAS wild type patients, you improve their progression free survival. The study did not show an improvement in overall survival, but likely the same thing happened what happened on EPIC in that these patients did get a salvage anti-HFR therapy. And indeed, half of those patients who got 
a, a, who were randomized to full theory did receive an anti-HFR therapy, which muddies the picture and you lose the overall survival advantage or you could miss an overall survival. And I think in this meeting also we see at, at GI ASCO a follow-up on the, again, the old RAS status. And when you look at the patients who have a non-exon 2 mutation, um, those patients did not benefit mm -hmm. on this study. And, and the, the, the overall survival is a little bit longer in patients who have an all RAS status who got full theory mm -hmm. plus penetumumab neighboring about 16 months. So I think it's really, it's really in the same story. We have the same story over and over again. I think all RAS is confirmed. Yeah, no, it's, you know, you raised a, a, an issue around response rate. And, you know, our first line response rate, I'm sort of opening this up to the gang, our first line response rate's in the, what, 60, 70 yeah. percent. And we have fancy second line drugs. We change a bunch of them in second line. Um, and yet our response rates are like 10 at best, you know. What happens? What, I mean, it, it feels like it's gotten smaller since I've gotten older. You know, the <laughs> second line response rates, used, you know, the bond too, you just said 22% in second line. And now with full theory, KRAS testing and all of that, our response rates, anybody got any thoughts about that, Alan? I think some of it is how we measure response. And, and the patients we We're going to blame it on resist? Well, I think it's, well, that's, we could, but I, I, think, <laughs> I think part of it is the, uh, our scanning, our imaging, when we treat patients now. So what constitutes a response and what doesn't? If you treat a patient with a two centimeter tumor, it's easier, you may be biologically more likely to get a response than a 20 centimeter tumor. And, uh, and we're scanning patients, so we're treating them early. I think the depth of response may be an issue. I, I, think that I think actually some of our agents may alter the imaging characteristics of a tumor, so response or not response. More likely is that's just true. Uh, and, I, and I'm actually, I, I believe to some extent that patients either have susceptible tumors or they don't. And I'm not convinced that it makes a heck of a lot of difference what chemotherapy you use in when or when in the broad, in the broad scheme of things that responsive tumors respond you're left with a, you, you choose out the bad actors. Uh, when they start progressing, you've changed the biology and you're just less likely to have an effective therapy. So now, until we get response, now, we're not curing this disease. Now, now let, me, let me say the one other in interesting question would be, what about if we did what we tried to do with lymphoma uh, two decades ago where we had promace cytobomb when you took 14 drugs and put them together in alternating usage? And what about Folfoxiri, the, the super combination? And, it, there's data that it's doable and and can be combined with at least bevacizumab, um, and that's an interesting question. The practical issue is even if you increase your response rate up front, does that make a difference down the road? And of course, when I talk to a patient about how we're going to treat the patient, before we're done with the conversation, they want to know, okay, what are we going to do next? And if you started with full Fox Siri, you have to be pretty original to come up with something that, that you'd follow it with. Got to keep going, but go. go. For the scientific geeks in the audience, the <laughs> listeners, okay? That would be a I think all points are well taken, but I think we are more and more understanding that the tumors are not the same when they're progressed under treatment. When we shrink 60, 70 percent of the patients down to very extended, um, um, maybe down to 10 or 20 or 30 yeah. percent, the tumor cells to survive are not the same we killed. So growing out of this are cells which have significant different potential genetic so makeup. So we should rebiopsy. I our think patients. we should. Absolutely. Two more studies before we move on.